start, why don't we just talk about how all of us met? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> Leonard, oh, I first. remember how I met you. <laughs> how did you meet me? Yeah, so um, it was Baby It's. Um, you were supposed to meet Dion at, yeah. at uh, the Esplanade uh -huh. and you were supposed to have Thai food with him. Uh, then Dion told me that he was meeting you. So uh, uh, I remember waking up and then remembering my dream and then apparently Jesus appeared in my dream and said, oh, you must Whoa. go to Esplanade and you must meet this guy because this guy, <laughs> this guy is very, very important to the scene. So I went down to the Esplanade and I met uh, Clarence. But how do you know that person was me? It could it be anyone, to be right? You, you because you were the only one that that had this this halo, this glow, you know. Oh. This, yeah, this this very uh, blessed, blessed blessed thing. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I remember when I met Clarence, we talked about uh, bandwagon because he just started bandwagon at that time, and I said, "Oh, Clarence, you know, J Jesus told me that you should go to Japan," <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, "Why?" And I said, "I, I remember telling him that." Uh, uh, because it was a problem that Dion and I faced when we were in Japan and we had just come back from Japan because we wanted to see uh, uh, where the gigs were and what bands were playing, but yeah. everything was in Japanese. Yeah. You know, all the magazines, all the publications, everything was in Japanese. So we, we couldn't understand Japanese and we didn't know like where some of the venues yeah. were, some of the bands that were playing. And I thought maybe if Bandwagon went there and did like an English version of this kind of publication, right, that that uh, can can uh, state where the bands are playing, uh, what venues, what time, then tourists and even like people who don't understand Japanese would, would, would you know, uh, uh, find that interesting because then they can look at that uh, publication and then just attend the shows. And I told him that he should go to Japan and do it and then he was like, yeah, yeah, I think that's a very, very good idea. And he said, oh, because my parents are actually yeah. missionaries and they live in Japan, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, since then, right, uh, every time I meet Clarence, wherever it is, right, I'll tell him that, eh, Jesus told me to come here. I don't know why you're here also. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, it's, uh, it's this uh, Jesus thing that we have. Yeah, la. and every time yeah. I see Leonard, I'm like, hey, this is the Jesus man. <laughs> yeah, he calls me Jesus man. Yeah. Reminds me of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is, is that accurate? Is that story accurate? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and that was is. what? Like it's a seven, story. seven years, eight years ago, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Amazing, right? And I remember the the there's one gig that always stood out to me. That was um Bandwagon Music Market. So back then we we had a, a, a stage there mm. and um Leonard was mixing that show for yeah. us. I remember yeah. I think after that chat I kind of got Leonard's number and I stayed in touch with him and then we were doing back then at our largest event, we had like you know 700 people coming out to Hard Rock Cafe uh, watching like 10 bands throughout the day and I remember mm -hmm. asked Leonard if he could mix it. Yeah. Yeah. And remember, do you remember that show? I remember. Yeah, and I also remember the, the the boat. Oh yeah. The boat, <laughs> you know, uh, he organized a, a, a gig um, on on a boat, yeah. On, on the, the, river the river boat. boat. River yeah, boat. Yeah. 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 So I went there and he said, Oh, can you be the sound man for the show? I said, yeah. okay. But I didn't know that he had three stages <laughs> because the boat had three levels, right? So there was one level that was uh, uh, more acoustic. The second level was band, and then the upstairs was uh, 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 the DJ sets. Yeah. Yeah. So there were three different uh, stages. And when I showed up, uh, I know Lin Ying was get, getting ready to perform downstairs. Then upstairs was, uh, um, what's the band's name? Aideen's band. Uh, yeah, Stop Gap. Stop Gap. Yeah, so Stop Gap was getting ready to perform also. And, and I had to run in between like <laughs> two levels to you know, adjust yeah. and then come down. And then with the current, the right? Yeah, and the yeah. boat's moving. Yeah. You have to walk so down, down without up and down, up and down. But fortunately, upstairs, the DJ said, oh, we can handle our, our own sound yeah, yeah, yeah. ourselves. Wait, so yeah. the three stages and one sound, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because he's so yeah. talented, yeah, we, yeah, must, yeah, we must make yeah, sure yeah. he helps yeah. us to mix all, all only, three floors. Only, only <laughs> Lana can do, can do that. <laughs> yeah, man. Amazing, amazing. And, and Josh, Josh, very interesting. Josh, how did we meet? Do you remember? Do you remember? Okay, so bandwagons, we have done 350 videos to date, right? But our number five, right? Fifth video was uh, Gentle Bones, Fit Josh Way. Josh, what do you think of yourself when you see yourself here? This was a very, very hopeful young man. <laughs> Wait, how old um, were you back then? 
17, 18. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is such a, a good memory. Like, really early days of, yeah. of Gentle Bones, yeah. where, like, where, like, one in, in a week we'd be, like, playing shows, like, three, four times a week. Yeah. It was, like, a time where, like, you know, we would go to, to like, SAJC, play a show, and then, like, get in the car and go to the next show and then hear our song on the radio and then wow. you just think like <laughs> it's the most amazing thing in the world <laughs> um yeah it was a time where like you know we would play shows and and like people would sing the lyrics yeah. and like i i i had never experienced that yeah, yeah, like yeah. At, at that point it was really really amazing but yeah it was, a, it was really an amazing time and i think that back then right it was kind of rare to like have like a violinist right yeah, yeah. I, I think that was kind of like my, my USP. A unique not, selling point. Yeah, it's not that I was a brilliant violinist. It's, <laughs> it's just that there was no other violinist. <laughs> and there was also a time in music where like having a violinist as part of the band or as, as part of your act was quite popular because all the popular music at that time was very indie and singer-songwriter. This was like Codaline, Mumford and & Sons and Ed Sheeran was like still playing guitar, like A-Team kind of mm. era. So like... I think that everything just lined up timing wise and, and I and I got a lot of gigs. Mm. You know, yeah. Yeah. So that was what, seven years ago? Yeah. So and today we are here with Josh. Long time ago. And uh, later we're gonna tell everyone why we are here with you today. I think yeah. something interesting to yeah. kinda tell everyone. And uh, before that, Nick, why don't you tell everyone here where are we? Where in Singapore are we right now? Where are we? Uh? I think we are at the legendary Snakeweed Studios. Oh, oh. Mm. <laughs> Yes, we are. But it feels like it. Looks yeah. like it. Hey, and you Smells like it. And you recorded here, right? Yes. Which year was it? Uh, I believe that was like early 2013. Yeah, I recorded here with the Confield Cup. And, uh, mm. Yeah, I remember <clears throat> it was like exciting times. Uh. Like when you when you book a, a recording session at Snakeweed with uh, Lennon Suse, I think uh, in your heads, you were like, okay, this is it. Like this yeah. is the turning point. Wow. <laughs> Everything's going to go up from here. <laughs> I think uh, many, many uh, independent musicians uh, share the same sentiment as me. Mm. So, yeah, I remember, uh, like Josh said, uh, hopeful uh, youngsters we were back then. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Wait, and, and Leonard, this space is kind of special for other reasons, right? It recently got a facelift. Uh, yeah. Okay, tell us more about what happened in this studio recently. Um. Um, I'm I'm more old fashioned now. So usually if if you know I'm used to a place, I just stick to it. Uh, but with Josh joining uh, Snakeweed, uh, Josh brought a new vibe because Josh is all about the vibe. So when mm. it comes to vibe, right? He said, oh, you know, we need to do renovation, yeah, or else the girls will not come here. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I didn't, yeah. I didn't say that lah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that lah. But then you know, like like uh uh. So we completely renovated the whole studio. Um, we tried to make it uh, more conducive for recordings and um, more comfortable for, for clients also and for the bands. Uh, because uh, uh, throughout the years, I find that, that if you take, uh, okay, most musicians, when they come to the studio, they are usually very, very nervous, you know, because they're paying for the time and then, and then, you know, they try not to make mistakes, but when they do, they get anxiety, you know? So, so we try to create this environment where they can feel very, very comfortable here. And then when, uh, when they start feeling comfortable, that's when you know, they become more creative. And then you can see that actually, you know, they kind of like love coming back. So you know, every year we try to like, like reinvent this place or re, mm. you know, like, like even like uh, uh, we just did uh, renovations two times in, in two years, no, two times in one year. Yeah last January and this, this January. Um, and you know, it, it also actually helps with uh, our own mental wellness because you know, we, we like coming back to a new place, you know, like a facelift. So we come here and then we feel comfortable and it also helps us to, you know, like to be more creative and, and uh, uh, work in a better environment. So you were telling me earlier about these panels, they were all customized by someone from Caracal. Yeah. Tell us a bit yeah. more about like what you guys did to this. Yeah, this, so this the entire place, right? Like even like all the, the panels, yeah. all the renovations were done by 
uh, Phil Teo, who's the guitarist of Caracal, mm -hmm. because he uh, uh, he's a carpenter and his family owned a, a, a workshop and a, a business. Uh. So he built like the the vocal booths, all these uh, panels. Uh, he had no experience doing this, but he went online and he searched like like how uh, how these panels were built. Um, even like these uh, sound deflector kind of things. Mm. Um, just now when you came, you stood in front of one and then yeah. I asked you to speak, right? Yeah. And then you spoke and then you felt weird because yeah. you couldn't hear the couldn't reflection. Hear. Yeah, because exactly. the sound uh, goes in there, it gets trapped because it bounces off all the different panels um, and then you don't hear yourself. So, so uh, feel kind of like read up on acoustics and all that and then he made that for me. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, how long has it been? This year is... This would be our 21st year. Wow. Actually, 22nd. Yeah, 22nd year. Last amazing, year was our amazing. Yeah, tell, how, how do you start? Like, I, I don't think this is something that like, a lot of people know. Like, how and why did you start by Snake Week? Um, okay, I was living in Toronto mm. um, and um, I was in the un university there uh, studying economics. Then, uh, on, in my final year, I decided that, that that was it. You know, I didn't want to do economics anymore. Um, I wanted to do music because it was my passion and um, I quit school and I signed up uh, um, uh, in a music school uh, for a music production course. Then I didn't tell my parents but when my parents found out, they were, of course they were really angry and mad at me but, but my mom at that time said, you know, like if this is what you want to do then I'll support you. Uh, so she paid my school fees in the school. And then I, of course, uh, finished the course. And, and then um, the recession hit at that time. So there were no jobs outside. Uh, studios weren't hiring. Uh, but what I did was I, I had like a six-track recorder. It was a cassette tape recorder. And I would used to go to, uh, I used to go to like all the jamming studios, you know, and see bands rehearsing. And some, some of the bands, you know, like, like I would knock on the door and then go in and say, can I just record your band for free? You know, I'll do it for free uh, and then I'll give you the cassette tape. So to me, it was more of like, like practicing also and honing my craft. Uh, for the bands, you know, what they got was a free cassette tape of them, themselves rehearsing. Um, I used to do it and I found that, oh, you know, this is how like I, I learned about mic placement. Like, you know, if you want to get a better sound, you put the mic here. Um, and stuff like that. Uh. Then um, um, I became a bum for a while or so because it was really bad then, the recession. So I used to stay at home and just watch TV. And I remember for one whole year, I did not leave my house. All I did was watch television. And there was this show called Revenge of the Nerds Part 2. Yeah, so it featured the, <laughs> the life story of... Uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And um, I wasn't really interested in Bill Gates. Uh, I was more interested in what Steve Jobs did. And I, I watched the documentary and it showed how uh, a guy who quit school, so it kind of like reminded me of myself, then he built his first computer, Apple computer, in his dad's garage. Uh, but he didn't know what to do after building the computer. So he barged into the, the offices of the vice president of Pepsi and he said one line to the vice president. He said, uh, are you going to spend the rest of your life bottling carbonated water or are you going to come join me, change the world? And security came and took him and threw him out. But that line, right, uh, kind of, if, I mean, it affected two people. Uh, it affected me and it affected the guy, the, the, the vice president, because he quit his job and he joined uh, Steve and they built Apple. And for me, it was like I was, lying on my couch and I was thinking, what am I doing in my life? You know, I'm just watching TV every day when I have all my skill sets, you know, like I have knowledge about recording and, you know, like how to make music better. And I realized that in Singapore, um, the scene was still like very, very, very behind. And I thought, you know, like if, if I have all these skills, right, maybe I go back to Singapore, you know, and try and uh, help the scene, you know, not to change the world, but at least make a difference to society here. So that's what I did. I came back to Singapore and uh, 
started Snakeweed. But when I started Snakeweed, it was actually a bedroom record label. So I was trying to uh, find bands that I could sign and then produce their work professionally and then release so that you know you can raise the standard of the, the music scene here. Um, at that time, there was a very, very vibrant underground music scene. This was around the late 90s. Uh, but the scene in Singapore was, I mean, music, music stations were playing your regular for, top 40 contemporary hits, but, but they weren't playing the music that the kids were listening to. You know, the kids were listening at that time were listening to like bands like Nirvana, Metallica, you know, which you rarely hear on radio because of the nature of the music. Uh, but the underground scene here was very, very vibrant. You know, you used to have gigs at uh, Youth Park, at uh, <clears throat> Substation, um, community centres, the World Trade Centre, you know. So, so every weekend, right, like you can just go to any of these places, right, and there'll be bands playing there. And these bands, right, are the ones who are organising their own gigs. You know, they get like, five bands together, they pull their money together and they organize a gig. You know, they they rent the equipment from our boy. You know, our boy will go down with his mixer and put two speakers <laughs> and then they'll just play and break his equipment and you know. Uh, so stuff like that used to happen very regularly at that time but none of these bands were actually releasing professionally mm. the music. You know, they were writing really good songs but they just didn't have access to recording equipment and at that time, there was no such thing as a home-based studio because mm. you couldn't buy like software and all that because last mm. time it was all tape and you know tape machines, mixer boards and all that. Um, so I worked in this studio called Mix, Mix Studios. Um, it was actually a rehearsal studio, but they had a small space for recording. And then I would meet some of these bands at the gigs and say, hey, come to Mix Studios, I record for you. <laughs> so they, you know, they would come and then I started recording a lot of these bands and then it just kind of like grew from there. Right, right. Wow. Amazing. And 21 years now. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Do you remember the first ever band that you recorded? Yeah, so the first, the first, uh, I wouldn't say band, lah, because that time when I was there, uh, I was also the Jaga Jam. So the Jaka Jam is the guy that sits behind the table when the phone rings, he picks up the phone and then he, he hears a voice on the phone and the guy will say, Hello, book jam, ah, two o'clock, <laughs> you know? Then I'm like, oh, okay, which studio, you know? So okay. I, I was more like the telephone operator. Yeah. But then I knew how to work the gear because mm. of my experience in Toronto. Uh, and my boss at that time got, just got married. So he went on a honeymoon leaving the studio to me, right? So I thought, okay, la, just record. La. <laughs> you know? And uh, I started recording bands. Um, and the first guy that approached me and said, oh, I, wa I want to do this compilation of local bands. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Roy Ong. Um, he started Mouse Records. So he put together a, a list of like 20 bands that he wanted to record and put it out and called it Menagerie. Mm -hmm. So that Menagerie CD... Uh, we, yeah. yeah, so that <coughs> Menagerie compilation was the first ever work that I did for, Singa for Singapore. Uh. Wow. And uh, uh, that I kind of like forgot all about it until recently when when, when Josh, Josh somehow found, it, right? found the copy and then he bought it and online. Bought, I ordered it. Really? Yeah. really? How, how did you find the copy? And like, like, I mean, I ago? asked him like yeah. what, what was the first... I asked him the same question. What, yeah. what was the first band you recorded? And he told me, oh, it's this album. So I just Google it and then I, I found it on sale on oh. like Mouse Records. I, I thought it was defunct, but I guess it's not. Oh. Their website. And then I like paid, like PayPal paid. And then it, it shipped to my house. Whoa. You, you have yeah. it? I have it. I, did yeah, you bring it's it home? In the, it's yeah, in the it was, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's here now? Yeah, it's here. Yeah. I think we need, we need to like listen to it. Yeah, it's a CD. I don't know. 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 Yeah. <laughs> you have a listening oh, yeah. party here. You have, the, you have the MP3 file or something. Uh? Or was that <laughs> even a thing? That time we yeah. no MP3. So anyway, when wow, the CD man. arrived, we were we were very excited, but then we didn't know how to play it. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. And it looked like it had been opened before. Oh right, right, right. <laughs> wow, amazing, amazing stuff. And Josh, how about you? What was your journey, you know, in music like? How I, did you get into this whole band thing and you know, 
how do you end up meeting Leonard? Like, what's the story? You know, I, I, it actually started because I messed up my O levels. This All is right. I never knew that. This is is kind yeah. of. I would always say this is the reason. Um, I actually DSA into Tomasic Junior College, which is a pretty good school. Um, uh, through the violin, I play violin oh, right. since I was five. Um, so I got a place there through DSA, and and I missed it by one point, like just one point. But that one point means you can't go anymore, like, You know, um, and then you know, growing up in Singapore, and like messing up your O levels, it like as a sixteen year old kid, it really like hit me really hard. I really thought like my life was over <laughs> because that's what you're told all all yeah. day, all day long, and then. I really thought, wow, this is this is the end. I have no future and everything, and and at that point, I just thought, wow, okay, I messed things up so badly. Um, I might as well do something I like mm. because clearly I can't do things I don't like. Mm. I, I never liked school. Mm. It it's not that I tried very hard and then I didn't do well. I didn't try because like I didn't like it, um, and. And yeah, so that was kind of like a, a turning point for me because I was like, yeah, if I, you know, at, at this point, I'm put in a position where I, I, I can't go to JC anyway. Mm. So I, I might as well find something I like. Mm. And so I was, the, the good thing is I messed up one subject very badly. So actually my R4 was pretty good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, science. I, I really, really don't like science. Okay. So I messed up one subject very badly. So actually my score to go to poly was, was, was not bad. Mm. Um, so then I was looking through all the poly courses and you know I had always been all right at music I enjoyed it I didn't I didn't hate it you know not the way like I didn't enjoy school and yeah so I just thought wow okay I saw the course Singapore Poly uh, it was called DMAT at that time music and audio technology um, and I just felt like this is this is it this is the course for me you know this has to be it so I applied and and actually it's a pretty not bad course. Like I still had to audition again to, to get in because I missed it by one point again. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it was like a eleven point or twelve point course at the time, and I and I was a short a point. So yeah, I went, I auditioned, I got in, um, and that's uh, that is what I would say is my entry into that. That was my entry into the professional world of not the professional world of music, but music as a profession. Mm. You know, that's when I kind of went to school and I'm like, wow, this is what I'm doing. Like this is every day I'm doing music now. This is my job. Mm. Um, and so that was how I got into music kind of full time. Mm. How I got into the industry was through this competition called Thunder Band Slam, um, which was organized by Thunder Rock School. And they held it at SP. Uh, so all the bands, it was a clash of the bands kind of competition. And I was asked to play violin for one of my friend's band. Um, and we didn't win, but I, I joined and Leonard was a judge. That's where I met Leonard, mm. first time. This was year one, Polly. Um, and the host, her name was Esther Lowe. Esther right, Lowless. Yeah, Esther Lowe. yeah. and, and I did the competition, didn't win. But after that, Esther asked me to play violin for her because she saw me play violin. And that was my first gig mm. ever. That was like my first professional call, you know. Um, and then after that, like I, I, st I played violin for her and then, you know, we would do shows and people would see me and, and they would ask me to play violin for them. Like her band members were also quite prominent musicians and they would, they would give me shows. And, you know, before you know it, I was playing for a lot of people. Um, just playing violin while I was in, in school. Um, and then during my internship, I, I, I interned here. I think Leonard, uh, Esther helped me to ask Leonard, or some, something like that. And then I got an internship here and then that's when I started to really be around Leonard. And, and um, yeah, and then he, he helped me a lot. You know, he basically told everyone they should hire me. So then I, I got even more work. Um, and then, yeah, I, I met Joel, Gentle Bones, and, and that was definitely another turning point in, in my life. Um, he became, a, you know, he went on to become a very prominent act in, in the industry here. Uh, and I was fortunate to be there from quite early on, you know. I was not there from the start start, but I was there like very, very early on. Uh, and I became a key player in his team. 
and then that just really created a whole career for me, I would say. You know, everything I have came from these very key moments in my life. You know, it was, it was on, on a writing trip. It was on a writing and production trip with Joel to Los Angeles, where I then met the man who gave me a job in Los Angeles. You know, so everything is so connected. And, and it, you know, this is kind of like the chain of events. I, I went on to live in LA for three plus years. Uh, and I worked as a producer and songwriter there, and then I came back, yeah, but everything just went like that. That's kind of the story in a nutshell. Mm. So how did this like meeting of minds happen between you and Leonard after you got back? Yeah, so I, I came back, not because I wanted to, I came back because of COVID. Um, it, this was when COVID was really, really bad. And essentially like the whole world shut down. You know, this was when we, were, we didn't even know what kind of disease this was and blah, blah. Uh, it, it just got to a point where the whole music industry shut down in LA for the most part. Uh, and I didn't see a point in staying any longer because I was incurring such a high cost of living. But now the industry has shut down. And I, and I actually held on for another six, seven months, but it, it started to not make sense. So, so I, you know, decided like, okay, I think maybe it's time to come back. Um, and so I came back to Singapore. Again, not because I really, really wanted to, but because I, I kind of felt I had no choice. Uh, and that's funny, that's kind of me after O-Levels. It's not, <laughs> it's not that it was my life plan to do music. I, I kind of put in a corner, you know, yeah. like I was kind of like in a corner and I had to make a decision. And at that point, the decision, what made the most sense was to come back. So I came back and then, and then I, I felt jaded again because it's, it's Singapore and, and like the ceiling is not very high. Uh, I, I, I didn't feel there were new acts for me to produce for. I didn't feel like there were new goals to, to, you know, to aspire towards. Um, and, and throughout the years, whenever I'm lost, I would like hang out with Leonard, lah, you know. And uh, we, we started hanging out and I came back and I still had work, so I needed a place to work. So I remember I, I rented a table from him uh, in, in that room. It's actually the, now the dining table <laughs> outside. But I, I paid him, I paid him uh, like a monthly rental. And of course he said, don't need to pay, and I paid. Um, but like I just rented a table from him to do my work. And so I started to come to the studio every day and this is me, like, while I'm kind of jaded and trying to figure what the next step is for me. Uh, I was coming to the studio every day. And then I realized, uh, wow, this place actually gets booked quite a lot. Like, business is, is good. Uh, then I started to look at the place. And it's a community for, for, for the scene, for the industry. There's so many people gathering here. There's bands, like, rehearsing behind. And then there, there's, like, bands, like, recording here. It's, it's a vibe, I mean, like people coming together, enjoying themselves. The business like checked out, you know, I, in my head, I was, I guess, unconsciously at the time also running numbers and like, does this make sense? This is not a bad idea. Um, and I think after one, two months, I, I was like, maybe this is my next step, you know, because as a producer, you are an individual, you know, as a songwriter, you are an individual. But when you are part of something like this, you are a community, you serve a much bigger purpose, you know. Um, and I felt that would be a very purposeful and meaningful next step. Mm. So, so actually, it was uh, the Charlie Lim show at MBS. I think they were just trying to pilot live shows back. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, we were there as well. Yeah. Doing our ART test. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. And that, that's, the, that's the story because during the ART, during the, the, sh the sh to enter the show, you must take the, the, yeah. the PCR ART test. And so Lena and I went and then we, we were at the clinic uh, doing, waiting for, the, it was a very long wait. It was like an hour wait. Uh, we were waiting to do the test. And then I just asked him like, hey, would you ever like take on a partner at Snake Week? And then he was like, Oh yeah, but depends on who's the person and like, you know, Masila. Mm. And then I was like, uh, what about me? <laughs> and then he was like, huh, yo, you're thinking of staying up? <laughs> because at that time, I wasn't sure if I was staying or not either. Um, 
And then he was like, yeah, I mean, I, he, he, he said he'd be open and he was down. And then I, I told him, okay, then, you know, good to know. Because I think for me, a big part was like, snake weed is Leonard's thing. Mm. You know, it's, it's synonymous with who he is and, you know, and I don't want to come and hijack that and, and just, you know, it's, he may not want to part with, with uh, you know, a share of the company and, and everything. So I was very, very cautious to, to even see if he'd be okay to, to have someone come on board to something he has run alone for so long, you know. Um, so when he said he'd be open, uh, I mean, that made me very happy. And I was like, okay, the next conversation we have can be a more serious one where we discuss the numbers and everything. And then I went home and I thought about it. And I, you know, I thought about how we could structure this. And, and then I came back to him and I said, you know, this is, this is what I can do. This is, you know, an amount that I think would make sense. And then we worked it out from there. Lah. Did the paperwork. I think January last year, we signed. January 2021. Yeah, January wow. 15. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. How is it like for you, Leonard? Like, you know, being happy, having operated as the, you know, sole founder for like 20 years and then mm. on your 21st year have this young, you know, energetic, talented young man kind of mm. tell you that he wants to join as a partner? Uh, when Josh first came here uh, to intern, he said, I don't want to learn anything about recording or producing. Just give me one room behind. I just practice my violin every day. Then I wouldn't get in your in your way. That was what he told me he wanted to do. So on the first day that he came here, uh, who was recording? Great Spy. Psalms. Uh, the Psalms were recording. So instead of giving him the room to go and practice, I said, why don't you just record this band? And then um, he was like, you, you know, like kind of like nervous, but he, I mean, he did it. And then I think he enjoyed it. Uh, and then slowly, you know, he started doing like, like Pleasantry and Great Spy Experiment. Uh, you recorded Saiful singing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was a start. I mean, that was the start to him uh, being more involved in production. And it was good to see, you know, like someone come here and having no interest, mm. but picking it up and then enjoying it. And then, you know, like going even further, like going to LA, you know, to, mm. to, to uh, work with uh, bigger artists. Uh, so when he came back, uh, of course, you know, he would be like the first choice, like, like without a doubt, because he was a very good intern, you know, and then plus, uh, uh, he played violins for so many of the acts that we were recording at that time. And then also uh, his expertise, you know, working in LA. Uh, and for me, I also could see that the trend in the trends in music was changing because there were less bands and more, you know, pop artists, more singer-songwriter uh, kind of, of artists in Singapore, which meant that, you know, there would be less recordings for me if I just focus on bands. Uh, and Josh uh, would bring a different element to the studio. So Snakeweed would not only record bands, but also work with, say, like Lin Ying and, you know, like, like Gentle Bones, uh, where the, the whole production, right, is done by the producer and the artist instead of having the whole band come here and just record. Uh, so it was, um, I mean, I mean, it was a no-brainer, you know. So if people say, I ask Nick, we are old school, are irrelevant, la. but Josh is relevant. <laughs> so, you know, he brings that, that to Snake Weed. La. And uh, um, so far in the one year that we've been here, I mean, we've been doing so much work until like now we cannot handle, you know, like it's just too many things to do already. And the work that Josh has been doing also has been, you know, like really excellent. Like, you know, like, I would never dream of, like, having JJ Lin, you know, but, but, you know, at least we can credit ourselves saying that we did the mm. JJ Lin Gentle Bone song. I think it's just such an amazing combination, like, for me to be here mm. with, because I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm, I'm really all about vibes. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean it, I mean it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a, a very technical creative I'm not the most technical creative, you know. For me, and, and I think this is something I picked up a lot in LA. Like, I didn't really have this mentality before. But in LA, it's kind of like, if you're not feeling it, then you, then day's over. Lah. 
go to the beach, <laughs> go and get... Here is like, if plan everything out, if we're not feeling it, push through and like, maybe have to reevaluate. And, 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 and in LA was where I really picked up like, okay, you know, it's all about how comfortable you are. It's about the vibe. It's about how you're going to express yourself, you know, creatively. And, and, when, and when I came back and to be in Snake Week, I remember when we were doing the renovation, it's like I see electrical demo tapes and things like all this is all these are like vibes. You know what I mean? Like this is like heritage. This mm. is such great music over so many years. Like were done inside like this room, inside these rooms, you know. Um, the amount of like culture that has passed through, you know, Snake Weed and that Leonard has created. Um, if I look at the music I've made in the last year, it's it's just different from the music I've made before. Like my, my whole approach and the vibe and everything is just, it's different. Like the energy here is, is different. And, and so it's just as much a privilege for me to like be able to like work here in this space. And like a lot of projects like we do together, you know, for, for the Gentle Bones, JJ Lin one, for the Lin, for the Linning stuff, it's like whenever I need something recorded, like Leonard is the best person to do it. There's no question. You know, I would never record drums on my own. I, I don't know how to do it properly. You know, I would never like record guitars and bass. And then I'm incorporating all these live elements into like my modern production. I, I think a big part is just because I'm here in this space mm. because I have like access to Leonard because I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just soaking in all the, the energy here and like it, it reflects on my work as well. Mm. So yeah, it's been, I think we couldn't have asked for a better year. Obviously we didn't know how things would go, you know, to sign a partnership like that mm. after Leonard has run it for, for so long. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was doing the contract, I included so many walk away clauses, all kind of clauses that would like protect the both of us, but specifically Leonard, should this partnership not go well? You know, what if like, what if we don't make money? Like what if things don't go well? Like I, I can't run his business down that he's built mm -hmm. over so long. So like all these things were thought of and put into the paperwork, but it all just turned out great. Like it's, I, I couldn't have asked for a better partner because our personalities are so different and that's why it works. Like I'm I'm about the paperwork, I'm about yeah. I'm about the planning, I'm about I'm about <clears throat> those things when it comes to business and, and Leonard is not. And at the same time Leonard won't say, Hey Josh, what, what what are you spending money on? Josh, what are you doing? Like you know, he mm. he he trusts me, I trust him, so it's uh, it, yeah. yeah. I never went through the contract. <laughs> really? For real? I tell, I, <laughs> let me tell you. Don't, don't say that in front of the camera. <laughs> no, no, we should, we should say this to the camera. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah. I, I told Leonard, look, I'm getting a lawyer to do the paperwork and you should get your own lawyer because that's how this works. Like, just in case, you know. Then I, Leonard said, oh, yeah, just use your lawyer. La. And Leonard, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have to have your own lawyer because like, it, you know, you have to make sure someone protect your interests. You know, not, I, my lawyer will protect my interests, right? So then he was like, oh, just share, share the lawyer. So then, okay, share the lawyer and then I have to think what will protect Leonard, what will protect me. Then I do the contract up uh, with the lawyer and then I go through with him and he's like, yeah, 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 no problem. And then I was like, this guy does not understand the contract at all. So I called the lawyer, I was like, we must have a sit down session where I sit Leonard down and you are on the call and you explain to him the key clauses inside. And then we did the call and she, the lawyer is talking, she's talking, she's a good friend of ours, she's talking. And Leonard looks at me and, and, and does this. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wow. heard a story of uh, Wormrod and Lin Ying yeah. being in the studio at the same time, yeah. listening to music together. Like, can you tell us more about that? Because like, yeah. that just feels yeah, yeah. like the perfect example of the combination of like Leonard and Josh. I was actually going to tell that story as well. Um, Wormrod was actually recording at that time. And Lin Ying was also recording her stuff at that time. But Lin Ying usually comes in the morning um, to afternoon and then Wormrod, Wormrod comes and then they take over until night time. Uh, so when Wormrod was recording, Lin Ying went into the control room and she said, can I be a fan girl? I just, I just sit quietly down here. I just, I just want to see them play. And then she sat in one corner and then she was just like in awe, in awe of them. Then they were recording. After the session, um, they went in the room. Then Lin Ying was like, oh my god, you guys are so, you know. So it's like, you would never expect Lin Ying to go and listen to Grindcore, mm. you know. But then she she understands and she appreciates music. Mm. 
So no matter what kind of, you know, like, and it's 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 like snake weed, lah. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of music you listen to, or what kind of music you play. But you know, people here who come here, right, uh, really do appreciate what the other bands or the other person is doing. And sometimes we also try to like, like do collaborations. Like uh, our ex intern Myra is a classically uh, classically trained violinist, you know, and very very Christian. Yeah. Right. And then <laughs> uh, uh, she was recording Worm Rot also. And she she liked the music, you know, surprisingly, because you know she would never listen to this kind of music, and she actually volunteered to play violins for their songs. So they said, okay, we make you our our fourth member. So you record some songs for us, and then uh, she went back and she she wrote and arranged all the string sections, uh, string arrangements for for their songs, and. Her parents wanted to know what kind of music she was listening to. Oops. Yeah, so she played she played Worm Rot to the the parents, and then she explained. She had to explain. She said, you know, it's not about evil, or you know, it's 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 very positive messages. And she said that you know, like like even like her violin parts uh, go very well with uh you know what what the the music was trying to say, and and you know they really really liked her, and then you know she's considered like the fourth member so they they told her if they ever go on, on tour in the states that she's supposed to join them wow you know, get out on stage can you imagine like in 10 years like yeah. she's sitting there and then she's like the new josh oh yeah like when i was interning here i was playing violin for all the artists and then you know i, I met worm rod yeah. and then we started traveling together they're gonna stop hiring violinists yeah <laughs> yeah so we we try to uh uh you know like get get people from different bands to collaborate and and do stuff together and like uh so far it's worked out for us uh, and it's worked out for the bands and also worked out for the scene because you know that's that's how actually the scene improves also having like collaborations between different groups of people who play different kinds of music but you know when they when they get together something new and beautiful comes out yeah there was a story also one of your interns Harris right he, yeah, Harris, he got yeah. credit on JJ Lin track right which otherwise yeah, yeah. may not have happened if he wasn't here right yeah Myra, yeah. And, Myra. And, and Harris yeah mm. so they were interns at the time and we were <clears throat> we were writing the song and you know so um, yeah Myra was a, a a big part of the songwriting process and then Harris came on to play bass you know so it's it's really great because I mean, I, I look back also and, and so many opportunities came for me during my, mm. my time as an intern here. Mm. And to think, you know, like if I was 17, 18 and I got a JJ Lin credit back then, I mean, yeah. that would be big. If I had a Gentle Bones credit back then, that would be big. Um, and now, fast forward all these years, you know, we are able to do that for a 17, 18 year old. Mm. That's progress lah. Yeah, and you what's know, interesting is also that he, he he's from Saints Among Sinners, right? Which obviously mm, makes very yeah, different kind of music correct, compared yeah. to what JJ Lin would, would, yeah. would sound like, right? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm forcing all of them to play <laughs> pop music. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they, they enjoy it, I mean, yeah, yeah they mm. they won't say they won't say oh just because it's uh, mm. JJ we won't play, you know, mm. because music is music, lah. Yeah, and then with the the community that we've been trying to build. Mm. Uh, includes all this yeah. interaction and collaboration. Mm. But Leonard, were you ever concerned, you know, when Josh mooted that this partnership to you, were you ever concerned about potentially, you know, diluting the brand? Because, you know, from the outside perspective, you know, Snakeweed's known mm. to like, especially be very, very active amongst like the punk, the rock, mm. metal, the heavier genres. And mm. now someone, uh, you know, Josh, like Josh brings a totally different element. Was there any concerns or even on Josh's end as well about that potential change in direction or that pivot or that dilution? No, I, I I never felt that there would be any dilution. I in fact I felt that it would have enhanced it. Like mm. like what we said, lah, Saints mm. Among Sinners would never, you know, mm. play bass for JJ Lin. Mm. You know? It's it's not a dilution, it's actually mm. more more of uh uh adding to the music and improving the scene. Mm. Because that's how I believe that's how we should grow, lah. You know, if we're just stuck in our own little Goons, right, and then and then we don't explore like different areas. Then, mm. then the scene will just like die off. I wanted to um, talk more about this uh, community um, mm. 
aspect of the of Snigri Studios that you mentioned. Because I noticed that a lot of bands are not like one of clients here, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. they always come back to you and yeah. you travel with them yeah. and you do live sound for them for the yeah. years to come and you do even like music videos for them. Things like yeah. that's not even anything you do with like audio recording. Mm-hmm. Like, can you tell, like, tell us more about that like in your relationships with these artists? Um, because most, most of the time, right, when the bands come to me, they're usually very young. And by the time like the album is done or they are ready for tours, you know, two or three years could have passed. And the relationships that are built uh, is based on this. Like, you know, it's not just the studio. Uh, I also hang out with with the bands. I also go and watch movies with them. Uh, you know, go out and eat, go and explore new Japanese restaurants, stuff like that. <laughs> uh. Uh, even like our videographer today, Michelle, uh, she was my ex-intern. But you know, we 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 have a very very deep friendship. So uh, when Caracal lost their guitarist and then they needed one, then you know I said Michelle, and then and then Michelle became the new Caracal guitarist. Uh, as for touring, um, uh, uh, it all started a long long time ago with Electrico. Uh, at that time, no Singapore bands were touring. No bands were going to play South by Southwest or anything, but. Dan Susun knew of the, the festival. I knew of festivals overseas because of my time living overseas. So I knew about South by Southwest, Canadian Music Week. And I told Dan, like, why don't we just apply, you know, like get the electrical to apply for, for these festivals. And uh, Dan did, and electrical was invited. So was Great Spy Experiment. And because I was producing both of these two bands, uh, I had to go along and also do live sound. So for me, it was like a trip, you know, a holiday, a uh, work holiday, lah. you know, working with the bands and, and going to different countries and playing and then seeing how uh, uh, different audiences react to Singapore music. And then um, throughout the years, right, every time like a band was invited, they would say, hey, Leonard, why don't you go with them? <laughs> or the band that was invited was probably the band that recorded here. So, so I would tour with bands, and then uh, we would go to South by Southwest, Canadian Music Week, uh, Summer Sonic, which Karaka also played, mm-hmm. uh, and different festivals overseas. And that's because uh, of the experience I have uh, touring, and I know like what to do and you know like where to stay. Um, I know how to prepare for a show, uh, you know, when the bands uh, go up on stage in a different environment where you know like it's a totally different scene and how to actually like uh, uh, do the sound there and you know like like make the band feel comfortable. Uh, so that's why a lot of bands always ask me to go on tour and um, the relationships are built over the years. Uh. Mm. Mm. So speaking of Baby It's Witch, I think like um, all of us know that it's one of the prominent uh, festivals here in Singapore. Mm. I know that Snake Week um, has a part to play like, yeah. f- for it even like existing so can you tell us more about that yeah so when baby it's first started it was started by uh wake me up music and uh rockstar collective Mm -hmm. Uh, but all the bands that were under wake me up music and rockstar collective were recording at snake at the time (laughs) so when baby it's were when you know the the bands that played baby it's the first year second year uh featured all the bands from there you know and they were all recording with me. So I would go to the Esplanade and do sound for them also. And um, so we kind of like started with, with them, uh, with Babies. And throughout the years, they've always invited me back to be a judge for the, the, the budding bands program, uh, the mentorship program. Um, the first time they, they had the mentorship program, uh, there were only two judges, just Razi from, from uh, the Rockstar, Rockstar Collective and me. Yeah. And uh, at that baby, we discovered uh, Caracal, The Firefight, and Giants Must Fall. Wow. This is yeah. 2007. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, I, I was and uh, Inch, yeah, but Inch, <laughs> Inch was at Allura. the time with, uh, yeah, with a band called Allura. So that kind of like kickstarted this whole mentorship program, this whole uh, budding bands program. And until like, even like until like last year, you know, I've always been involved with baby with the, the budding bands program and seeing all the new talent that's coming up. Yeah, so I guess as a closing question, 
Uh, I think very nicely dovetails to, to this last question. So, you know, if we could boil this whole one hour chat into just this last question, um, what is Snake Wheat's aspiration um, in the coming year? You can have yours, I can have mine. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the same. I hope one artist will actually break through. Uh, if, it's, if it's not Lin Ying, then you know, someone else. But I, I think the time is right right now for some of our Singapore ex to actually wake up and you know like do something and then get out there. Because it's been two years since um, anyone has done anything and it's been very, very quiet here. Yeah, I think for me, like at Bandwagon, having run this for like 11 years, I think my, my, my hope is, I guess, quite simple. You know, like when people think of Asia or let's say specifically Singapore, they know like Marina Bay Sands. They know like maybe durian, yeah. satay, right? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I'm longing for the day where people would say like, hey, there's this particular artist that I know or the, a particular song that they can kind of sing even like a chorus. Mm. I think like, that for me would be a win that, you know, we have managed to kind of, um, um, you know, imp impact uh, mm. people beyond our shores and kind of like spread mm. our culture, our message that's mm. unique to us and to the world and also to find a unique identity. Mm. I think that that's something that drives us you know, mm. and, and will continue to drive us over at Bandwagon. Yeah, so I think with that, mm. thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Can, I, can I do a shout out? Yeah. Okay, there's this guy, uh, his name is uh, Caesar Edmonds. Mm -hmm. um, he's this young Singapore guy. Uh, he applied to uh, all the music schools here, got rejected. Uh, but it, he wasn't disheartened, so he went to study in Liverpool um, and got a job in a studio. And this guy has won Grammy Awards. What? Yeah, wow. but nobody knows. So you know, and he's kept a very very low profile, but he's a Singaporean guy. Wow! Hey, we need we need Caesar to get Edmonds, we need to get a hold yes. of this go, guy. Go thank you, thank you for the tip. Yeah, go do we, a story on him. Go, go chai chi set, you know. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow, wow. Hey, we need to do a wow. video interview with this guy, man. Chai Chi Sai or Sigla or something. Yeah, like yeah. Wow, <laughs> amazing, amazing. Josh, any shout outs before we close the nah, session? Nah, I would have given the same shout out. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Bantu. So, yes, thank you for watching this video. <laughs> if you enjoyed this wonderful chat with Leonard and Josh and would like to see more, please let us know in the comment section what you think, who you'd like to see us interview next. And of course, like and subscribe on the channel right below. We'll see you for the next one. Thanks Nick for joining again. Thank you. Yep. Thanks guys. Okay. We'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Bye.